the old man moves with urgency along winding streets. He senses the Holy Spirit upon him, and his heart is beating ever faster. The question he's asking is, could this possibly be the day? The one I have waited for my whole life. And as he goes, he also carries with him this sense of pain. He has been waiting. This pain is partly his own. He's aware of his own incompleteness. But it is also the pain of his people. The prophets have said, you people are to have a special place in God's plan. You're to be a conduit for his grace to flood the earth. And yet for hundreds of years, these people have been like the minnows, the kicking ball of the bully boys of history, whether it's Persia or Greece or Rome. And they carry this distaste for the overlordship of these powerful peoples, and yet at the same time, they imitate the very values they say they despise. And as he makes his way ever closer to his destination, he reflects back. He thinks one day, of course, the prophets say it will all change. Our mouths will be filled with laughter, our bodies with joy. There will be the ushering in of a new kingdom. The metaphors the prophets use tumble out of their lips. It speaks of personal transformation. It speaks of cultural, social, political, economic, everything. Everything is to change. And this old man, Simeon, thinks back to his own experience of God years before. That moment when there was a whisper of the Spirit in his heart. That whisper was so unusual, so unexpected, it took him some years to come to terms with it. That you, Simeon, will see the one who will usher in this new kingdom. Me? Now? After all these years? As he processes and tries to work out how he should respond, he realizes over time he's to wait. He's to watch. He's to pray. That in some strange way, in the providence of God's grace, his prayers matter for the coming of the Messiah. He finds his way to the temple courts. The spirit that has led him there takes him to Mary and Joseph. And then the moment. He takes the baby in his arms the consolation of all Israel. Totally centered, totally at peace, this is the moment his life has been building to. And he says these words, Lord, let your servant now depart in peace. I'm done. I've played my role. It was unexpected, It was out of the public eye, but I prayed and I waited, and now I've seen him. And the Christian church has taken those words and they've called it the nunc dimittis, as it's echoed down the worship of Christian history. So my question to you this morning is what would be your nunc dimittis moment? What would your life look like to be able to say at the end, I'm done. I played my role. However unusual, however unexpected, whether like Simeon thought it was out of the public eye or you end up with 10 verses in Scripture. If you'd asked John Coltrane that question, what's your moment, I know how he'd have answered John Coltrane, fabulous jazz musician, played with all the greats, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, broken man as well as jazz supremo, addicted to drugs, alcohol, 
comes to faith, turning point. He says, I want to take my music now, Lord, and use it as a prayer. So Johann Sebastian Bach said, music is for the glory of God and the refreshing of man's soul. Coltrane's big piece was Love Supreme. Includes soaring, soaring sax solos. There was one time he played it live, 20 minutes. The critics said, this is the best we've ever heard it. And as he got off the stage, he was heard to say these two words, quietly, under his breath. Nunc dimittis. I'm done. You can take me. I can't do it better than that, Lord. That was for you. If you asked Hannah Moore what her moment would have been, she would have said, give me a pen. She was actually already famous by the time she came to faith. Samuel Johnson said she's the best verse maker in the kingdom. She immediately wrote a book about why faith matters to what she called the fashionable classes. It got so talked about that people complained that they had to read it before going to fashionable parties because it's what everybody was talking about. Five reprints in two years. Then Hannah Moore said this, it's all very well going for the elites, but I want to go for the masses. I want to go for the uneducated person. I'm going to use my skills now for popular, simple language tracks which talk about faith and conduct, virtue and character. So one of those great examples of unanticipated success. The working man was not interested. But the mothers of young children loved these books and read them at bedtimes. She sold two million in the first year and it was said that for generations children were raised on Hannah Moore's stories. At the end she could say, cheap tracks that the masses read, I'm done. How about you? Thomas Arnold would say, give me a school. He had this unusual conviction that if you would teach faith, followed by character, followed by sharpening the intellect, then you could lease into society a whole avalanche of young men and women who would be the most fantastic citizens and could shape society. He had, to put it lightly, exacting standards. But he transformed the school he was headmaster of at rugby in Warwickshire. People said you could tell Arnold's boys when they went up to Oxford because they went to chapel when they didn't have to and they cared for the poor. He had 23 assistant heads during his time there. Each one went out to be a head somewhere else. So the whole of the school system started to change. One historian said Arnold had an incalculable effect on world history. Who knew you could do that from a study in rugby? An incalculable effect on world history. Why? Because he did his thing. It's about our passion, it's about our skill, and it's about the things that God whispers into our heart in the quiet moment. The things that we then have to hang on to through the years. Rembrandt painted this scene. I'd like you to see it. Rembrandt is dying as he paints this. It's actually found unfinished on the easel in his studio after his death. I don't know how well you can see it, but when you get up close, this is not just a story from the Bible, this is personal. This is an old man who knows he needs the consolation of Israel. Rembrandt is aging, his health is failing, he's in debt, not a good thing to be, incidentally, in thrifty Calvinist Amsterdam. All of his children but one have died. His first wife has gone as well. He's looking into eternity and he's saying, I need the consolation of Israel for myself. 
But then you may notice his hands under the baby. They're not as they would normally be when you're holding a newborn with your hands cupped. They're rather shaped as a prayer or an offering. What did Rembrandt have to give that nobody else could give? He had the ability with his hands to put oils on a canvas and make it extraordinary. As he is preparing for his own passing, he's offering what he has. This is Rembrandt's Nunc Dimittis moment. And so as we start today, and we look out, we listen out for the call to renewal, I want to ask you two questions. Firstly, would you receive the consolation of Israel yourself? You cannot give away what you've not got. You cannot work for a renewal that's not already singing in your heart. And secondly, would you offer your hands as a representative of your gifts, your resources, your time and your energy, and say, I'm here for the renewal of all things. I'm going to invite us in a minute whether we'd stand in a moment And I'm going to invite you to put your hands out as an imitation of what Rembrandt is calling us to do. And for your hands to represent what you have. And say right at the start of today, I'm available. Take me to that point where I can say, I'm done. I played my part. I'm ready to go. Should we stand together? I wonder whether to bow our heads and I just invite you, if you're comfortable, just to put your hands out as symbols of your, what you have. Five loaves and two fishes that sum up your passions, your availability or your lack of it, your intellect, your passion, your gifts. Even the questions that you have in your heart. Of course, Lord, but how on earth with me? And we pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would rest on us at the start of this day. That we offer to you ourselves. And we thank you for the example of Simeon. Waiting, looking, praying. That extraordinary moment of seeing the hope of the world. We're here for you. We're really only interested in you. But we want to serve you too. Now take what we have. Multiply it and glorify your name. In Jesus' name. Amen.